We're gonna keep seeing more and more of this as time goes on, unfortunately. What I'm talking about today is a couple Go modules that were found to be disk wipers. Now, disk wipers are a malware that what it does, as the name kind of implies, is it wipes the disk of your system. So how do these get into the Go ecosystem? What do you do if you find one of these? And kind of what is the, the way we'd solve this threat landscape as it applies to languages like Go, an article by Socket, which by the way, a lot of the stuff in here feels AI generated, like these titles and this image. So Socket, take it easy. But uh, the article here talks about these three modules for Go, Proto Transform, Go MCP, and TLS Proxy. The issue with these, or kind of the problem with the Go ecosystem as a whole, is Go modules do not have like a centralized repository for them to live, right? Literally anybody can write a Go module and you can put it on GitHub. And then when you go to write Go code, you just add that GitHub URL to your Go module. And then from there it pulls it down and runs it. There's no centralized repository. There's no signing, right? That cryptographically proves this package is approved by the Go foundation or whoever. So hackers, if they can do do is they can write a module that just has the name of a thing that you need to use, right? So if for this one, go MCP, MCP being model context processor, think of it as like a USB-C cable for an AI server. If you want AI to do a task, you write the MCP client that ties into an MCP server and you can use that to make the AI do some kind of thing. And then TLS proxy being another obvious one, right? TLS is transport layer security. That is the protocol that is used to do things like uh, encryption for HTTP, and so if you have a proxy for that, you can sit in the middle and do a man in the middle attack of a TLS connection. So maybe a hacker wants to use a package like this. What Socket found here is there was a hidden function inside of all this code called EGT rock. It's not important what it's called, but all it ends up doing under the hood is running binish taxi, which is the way that you invoke a system command via exec. You're running the shell and a command name. And then under the hood, it goes through and it runs this very complex string, right? It's like an obfuscated string with a bunch of crap in there. Now, this function here is what's called obfuscator, right? Obfuscation is this idea of hiding in plain sight what you're doing, but making it very hard to expose the nature of what's actually happening, right? And this one's actually fairly trivial. What they have here is a string that looks like a bunch of gobbledygook nonsense, right? So you just kind of scroll through here. You can't really see what any of this means. The reason they may have done this is if they're waiting, if they're anticipating that antivirus maybe scanning binaries. If you have a string that says like, you know, rmtac rf slash in a binary, maybe antivirus will flag that off of the signature and say, hey, that's going to be a disk wiper. Maybe we don't do that. So they used runtime deobfuscation, right? They took the 11th digit and then the fifth digit and the 47th digit and so on and so forth. And what it ends up actually being is this command here, ddif dev zero of uh, dev sda block size is one meg and then f Sync. So what, what's happening here is they are running a bash script locally that takes the zero device. So it is just a device in Linux that has all zeros and it's pumping it onto SDA, which is the first partition of your drive. So it's doing it in one megabyte blocks. So it's doing it very quickly. And at the end, it's syncing it. So if there's any uh, middle layers of cache between your file system and the actual hardware, it's making sure that it flushes that down to the disk. And so you are truly zeroing out your stuff. And obviously when you're doing this, you have complete data loss, you have operational downtime if this is done in a, in a server environment and you, know, you maybe lose your, your financial and reputational damage. The overall issue here, guys, is that Go as a language is very powerful. It's a great backend language. It's runtime garbage collected. It's a very powerful language for doing backend work. The issue with Go from a security standpoint is it opens the door to supply chain stuff, right? And, and you know, this is true for any language like Python or JavaScript, ones that depend on these very, very large repositories like pip or NPM, where to do pretty much anything useful, you have to use packages that other people write. Now, having an architecture like this allows people with minimal experience to very quickly deploy apps but the problem that comes with this as well is you're kind of downloading and trusting arbitrary code with not really knowing what's going on. You could make the argument that this is similar to the XZ backdoor, which if you don't know what that's all about, the XZ backdoor is 
an incident that happened last year where a person named Jaya Tan, who, which is crazy that we still don't know who Jaya Tan actually is, put a back door into LibLZMA. And when LibLZMA detected it was being ran inside of OpenSSH, it would allow for a hard-coded private key to let somebody into the server. The public key was in the server, obviously, but it was waiting for that private key, which meant that one singular person, if this had gone through, would have been able to log into any OpenSSH server for the rest of history until the backdoor was found. This is your go-to supply chain attack. Now, the way that this was able to happen is because the supply chain and open source are the people, the contributors, right? And so this Jaya Tan character is supposedly a series of nation state actors that were trying to take advantage of the fact that the maintainer of LabelCMA was very burnt out. They were saying, hey, you don't care about the project. Hey, you don't care about the work that you do. Let us take over it for you. And then so Jaya Tan injected his malicious code into the repository and nobody knew the difference. Nobody saw it coming. Now you may be wondering, you know, what do I do about the supply chain threat when it comes to any language, Go, Python, JavaScript, etc.? What am I supposed to do as a person who just wants to write code and not worry about getting hacked, but also not rewrite every library function under the sun? I found a, uh, a thread on Reddit here. I'll link it in the description below. Basically, what it turns into is a trade-off between usability and easiness and paranoia and delusion. You kind of have like this spectrum of like the far left of the spectrum being write all the code yourself and the far right of the spectrum is just F it, download all the packages, don't look at any of the maintainers, just do whatever you want and don't worry about security. There is a happy middle and the happy middle that I typically do is, first of all, when I go to download a package, I'm looking very carefully at the URL. I'm like, hey man, is this actually the person that that I want to trust. Is this the proper way you spell this thing? Because typo squatting, the ability to uh, use a common typo in a word to host malware is also very common. I'm just very diligent about the software that I do download. Also, Another thing that they recommend here that I also completely agree with is I do all of my development in a virtual machine. The reason being I do a ton of low level coding, I do a ton of package based coding like in Python and in Go. And because of that, I'm upping my risk to being attacked by the supply chain method I'm talking about, but also I do a bunch of capture the flag, right? I'm running these weird programs that are like reversing crack me's that people send me. And if I'm gonna run them on my computer, I'm gonna put them in an environment that if it gets compromised, I can just tear it down and pull it back up. Another way to do that is through containerization or through OS's like Tails where every window effectively is its own virtual enclave, right? There are ways you can be a coder that is aware of supply chain threats, but also be diligent and use code that other people write without completely compromising yourself. It's a healthy balance that is difficult to strike, but I think you can do it. Lean on supply chains that have more inherent trust, right? So what that means, for example, when writing a Go program, make sure that you can actually go to and read the code and, and identify that the person that is writing the module you're using is a trusted source, right? One of them that I use for projects I work I want to do in Go is Gorilla, right? Uh, Gorilla Go, yeah, so Gorilla, the Golang web toolkit. The reason why I trust this is because other people use it, other people have audited it fairly heavily, and up until this point, there have not been any obvious vulnerabilities or, or backdoors found in the software, right? So because of that, it is a supply chain that I trust. As opposed to, if you see this like one little offshoot program that it has very complex functionality, not a lot of stars, and maybe like you thought you saw this package under somebody else's name, but now you're seeing it under this random guy blank Logia or whatever, maybe you don't use that one. Other than that, guys, there's not a ton you can do against supply chain attacks. It's more just being aware of how far down your dependencies go and how trusted the chain is of those dependencies. Anyway, guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. If you're new here, hit that sub button. I make videos about little cybersecurity, software security incidences all the time. I'm a software engineer in my day job. And then after you press that sub button, go check this video out about a similar issue with Go that was found a couple months ago. We'll see you there. Goodbye.